ladies. Good stretch. It is such an honor and a privilege to be with you today. I'm just uh, delighted to have this opportunity. In my career, I've had the opportunity to observe a lot of leaders and came to the conclusion that most of the rules that we've been taught about how to lead are all wrong. So I came here today to talk to you a little bit about that thesis. And I want to start by giving you a visual image of what I'm talking about. So go with me here. Imagine for a moment that this auditorium is, in fact, the seats at a Broadway show. And we're awaiting the beginning of the play. When a show begins, the lights dim, the music comes up, and the spotlight hits the stage. It's at that point we know that the main actor is going to appear and the story is going to begin. So it is with your leadership. When you assume a position of leadership, you are stepping into a spotlight. All eyes are focused on you, waiting to see who you are, what you're going to say or do, waiting to see how the show is going to turn out. But what if the picture was different? What if when the spotlight hit the stage, you were not in it? Well, the people would be pretty confused. They would wonder where you were, wonder if you didn't understand your role, until they noticed that you were actually walking back up to the light box at the back of the stage, and you were going to shift that spotlight to focus on those that you'd been called to serve, to serve them well, and to produce an amazing show. Now, 40 years ago, a man named Robert Greenleaf came up with this notion that there are, at the extremes, two kinds of leaders. One he called leader first, and that is all about advancing the leader, taking advantage of the power they've been given to improve themselves, their career, their resume. At the other extreme, Greenleaf said, was a leader who serves first. That leader also has power. They've been entrusted to lead, but they use that opportunity for the benefit of those who follow that. Now, interestingly, academics and authors have written a lot of books about this kind of leadership called servant leadership. There's a famous one called From Good to Great by Jim Collins. Then just a couple years ago, Adam Grant from Wharton wrote another one called Give and Take. And in these amazing best-selling books, they proved that the leaders who served their teams and organizations best produced superior performance results. So the books have been written, but skepticism prevails. We haven't seen many of these kinds of leaders in the workplace, these leaders who serve, where are they if it's such a great idea? The leaders that we see in the marketplace, we say, well, those are the ones that create results, and these servant leader people, well, maybe they should run our charitable organizations. Because, of course, nice guys and nice girls finish last, right? Well, I came here today to challenge that idea with you and to ask you to reconsider whether you've been taught the wrong rules of leadership. The rule I'm gonna to talk to you about today I call dare to serve. And it's defined this way. Dare to serve leaders are those who are courageous enough to take the people to a daring destination, yet humble enough to serve them well in that journey. And I've come to believe it's in this dynamic tension between the courage and humility in the leader that creates the conditions for superior performance. So this is not just Cheryl's theory. I brought to you today a case study from the marketplace from a large publicly traded company to share some insight about what dare to serve leadership might look like. In 2007, Popeyes was a struggling 35-year-old company, had declining sales, declining profitability, very angry franchise owners, and shareholders who had watched the stock drop 
from a peak of $34 in 2002 to $13 on this particular day. What better time for a grand experiment in leadership? There was absolutely nothing to lose. What if we were able to give this enterprise a daring destination, an aspiration to pursue, humbly serve the people of Popeyes? Could we produce amazing results? And could we do that in a public company environment with shareholders breathing down our back every quarter? Huh. Well, we did. And here are the three tenets of the approach we took. First, we did this thing. We declared the daring destination. At my very first meeting with the Popeyes organization and all of our franchise owners, I stated the bold ambition that we were going to pursue. And I said these exact words. I said, we have a bold ambition. We're going to make this brand Popeyes the hottest concept in quick service restaurants. We will grow sales, restaurant profits, and new unit returns to top tier among our competitors. Well, was that a daring idea? Or was that just plain harebrained? Out in the marketplace, people said Popeyes was a had-been. Do you actually know, Cheryl, you sell fried chicken? That's over. There were no people standing in line to buy in to this daring destination. Most were skeptics. After the conference, we had to go do the work, right? We had to go back home. We had to create our strategies, our strategic plan. We called it our roadmap to results. And then we had to do, you know, the work of making new advertising, new products, making our restaurants run better, finding ways to save money so our owners could make more money. We had to do all that hard work. And then what would we do next? We'd just write, watch the bucks come in, right? It'd be easy after that. We had a plan. We are going to execute it. Piece of cake. But you know what? That actually wasn't the most important thing we did. And it wasn't the hardest part. The next choice that we had to make is we had to choose to serve. Now, I remember this meeting like it was yesterday. We went to a hotel off-site conference room. You know, we had flip charts like you always do. And we started talking about what kind of leaders we wanted to be for Popeyes. And we stumbled upon this question of whom would we serve? And we started writing things on the flip chart. Well, we'd have to serve those shareholders. They're not all that happy. And we'd have to serve, you know, well, the employees, they are important because, well, oh, what about the guests? We have to serve the guests. Um, we have these regulators in Washington. Then we have these accountants that look over our books. And we have bankers that loan us money. Oh, my goodness. Who should we serve? We landed on a decision to serve our franchise owners as our first and foremost priority. We said, you know what? These franchise owners in our business, what a franchisee does is they borrow money and they build a Popeye's restaurant and then they hire and train everybody and then they serve the guests and then they give back to the communities where they live. You know, we said, I think they're pretty important people. What would happen if we measured our success by their success. Hmm. Well, that sounds maybe kind of obvious. And well, of course, Cheryl, you'd serve those people. Those are your customers. They're great people. They've invested a lot in the business. But I got to tell you the other part of the story. At the time we started talking about this, we didn't even like these people. <laughs> Have you ever met a franchisee? They're small business owners. They're really opinionated. They have lots of passion. When they're mad, they're a little bit difficult to be with. They're always challenging everything you do. You know, these people are not all that fun. <laughs> well, we laugh, but you know, it was true. At that time in our company's history, we didn't even like the people we'd been charged to leave, lead. And so even more importantly than declaring a destination and choosing who to serve, I think maybe the most important decision we had to make was the next one. We had to decide to love the people we lead. What would that look like? If we loved them, would we listen to them? 
Would be, we be interested in their challenge? Would we want to hear about their problems? Would we see their passion as commitment to the future of Popeyes? Would we love them enough for mortgaging their homes and putting their, all their family to work in their restaurants? Could we love them that much? You know, it was a game-changing notion. And if I had to tell you one thing that changed the course and the trajectory of Popeyes, it would be that, that we decided to love the people that we lead. Now, I really wish I could have brought two or 300 of the franchise owners here today to talk to you, because I'd rather they report on, out on this than me. I brought a picture of one. That's John Broderson. If you ask our franchisees, and here's how we do it, we survey them every year and we ask them to rate our leadership. And they give us an A, B, or C just like you get at school. And when we started this, our franchisees said they were 76% satisfied with our leadership. Not very good. I would tell my daughter that's something like a C, right? Last summer when we did exactly the same survey, our franchisees rated our leadership 93% satisfying, 93%. I think that's an A still. And we have to earn that every day. That's not a score you keep unless you continue to do it day by day. But we served those folks well. We loved them, and it's differentiated us from all the rest. Now, there's a third and final step that doesn't often get discussed, and that is we actually delivered results for them. I draw your attention to this because if we hadn't delivered results at Popeyes that benefited those franchise owners, there's a really good chance I wouldn't be here today to talk to you, right? No one would be really that interested in our new rules of leadership, or what does it mean to dare to serve? No, there's no need for that conversation unless the leaders produce results. So very quickly, let's fast forward to today and just glance at those results to see if we have the credibility to talk about leadership. Today, we're one of the top two or three fastest growing quick service chains in America. Our restaurant sales are up 36%. Our restaurant profits are up 76%. Our market share is up 68%. That nasty share price that was $13, yesterday was about 59 or 60. So now the marketplace is a buzz, and now the marketplace is interested in what produced Popeye's results. So let's take that story and apply it to you. What would it mean if you were to become a dare to serve leader? Wherever you are, whether you're in school or an athlete or in your community or your home or business, it doesn't matter. Wherever you are called to lead, what would it look like if you had a daring destination, if you chose to serve the people well, and if you measured the performance results and wanted them to be the best? I believe if you did those things, you too would have a great story to tell. In the next few minutes that we have together, I wanted to share with you a few personal insights from my life and career on how I got to this point of view and why I'm so compelled to tell people about it. Let's start with this idea about being brave. You've heard about it quite a bit this morning. You've heard about courage and brave acts from each of the speakers. So why is being brave so important? Let's start with a story of my third daughter. Her name is Katya. I adopted Katya at the age of 11 from Russia. She's a brave girl. So when she was a senior in high school, her senior class took a trip to, of all places, South Africa. And Katya brought home the permission slips for the trip for me to sign. I said, OK. She laid them all out on the kitchen table, and I signed all of the exciting trip forms except shark cage diving and bungee jumping. Evidently, Katya signed those forms. <laughs> when Katya came back from South Africa, she kind of forgot about the forms, and she goes, Mom, I went bungee jumping. I said, really? That's interesting. My 18-year-old jumped off a bridge, 
It's the highest commercial bungee jumping location in the world, 709 feet above a river. And she was so excited that she brought the DVD home to show me what it looked like. <laughs> and so I was intrigued to watch this. And as Katya tells her story, the DVD goes on. And I hear yelling and screaming and very loud sounds. And that's my daughter Katya screaming like she's going to die on the platform of the bungee jump. I could relate to that. I think if I'd been on that platform, I would have died right there. But not Katya. Katya went on and completed the jump and had a story to tell. I want you to imagine this for just a moment. This video isn't Katya, but you'll get the, you'll get the idea. video still gives me goosebumps <laughs> every single time I see it. Now, I've already admitted to you, I am completely adverse to physical risk-taking. Wouldn't have done that for any amount of money. But I'll tell you what, it intrigued me. I wanted to know more about brave and crazy people. And it turns out there is another academic piece of research. This is a very small study, but it's really cool, done by a couple of Australians named Brimer and Odes. And they actually studied people who do stuff like this. And they looked at people who do things like base jumping, waterfall kayaking, big wave surfing, mountaineering. And they found this really interesting finding. They found that the people who do these things are transformed in two ways. They become more courageous, and they become more humble. Hmm. Now, apparently, pursuing things that have a real chance of death builds your courage. That kind of made sense to me, right? If you keep jumping off buildings, you're eventually going to think that's normal. <laughs> However, the humble part was not as intuitive to me. But it turns out that if you do brave things, you are humbled because you start to realize you're not in control of all the outcomes, and it's not all about you. Dare to serve leadership is this same paradoxical thought. It takes immense courage and a deeply humble soul all at the same time, because the leader does have to call out a brave, daring destination for the people, and then come alongside them, but not knowing how it's all going to turn out. That's the tension of the uncertain outcome married to the daring destination that leads to great things. So we first, we have to be brave, and then second, we have to serve others well. What does that look like? I think most of us are skeptics about this idea that serving others well is part of leadership, and I think I was too. For 20 years, my leadership philosophy was summed up in these words. I am a leader who thinks like a man, acts like a lady, and works like a dog. Some total. That was my philosophy. It worked for a really long time. But along the way, I met these other people that were doing really interesting work, mostly in nonprofits. You know, I met missionaries and social workers and 
people running soup kitchens, and I admired their leadership, and I thought, wow, they're really doing important work, and they're really making a difference in the world, and I think I was embarrassed that I worked in for profit. I think I was kind of afraid to even think about what that meant. And then I met all these leaders, my bosses and for-profit organizations, and they pretty much lived up to that leader first, it's all about me thing. And eventually I had to sort that out and say, what kind of leader do I want to be? And if I died tomorrow, what would I want to be remembered as, as a leader? And interestingly, as God does, he gave me the opportunity to think about that when I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2001. Nobody likes getting diagnosed with cancer, but type A personalities have a particular problem with it. Okay? We think we are in control. Okay? We think we've got a plan. We're going places. We've got stuff to do. I was raising three kids. I had a husband. I had work. This was a big, giant interruption. But one of the really cool things that happened while I was going through my treatments is my girlfriend gave me a book, because that's what people do. When you have cancer, you get lots of books, lots of candy, lots of fruit baskets. It's kind of what you get. She brought me this book, and the title of it was called The Purpose Driven Life, and it was really a bestseller at that time, so everybody was reading it. And I left it on my nightstand with the other 20 books. And one day I opened the front page to the first chapter. I actually didn't read the whole book, just to be totally honest. I opened the first chapter, and it said this at the beginning. It says, Cheryl, it's not about you. The purpose of your life, and I would add, your leadership, it's not about you. I had to sit down for a little bit and think about that because I was pretty wound up and excited about my work, my leadership in the community, my family, but it wasn't about me. The truth of the matter is the purpose of your life. The only thing you'll ever be remembered for is what you did for other people. That's it. That's the only memory that survives. And I'm here today because I don't want you to have to wait for that cancer diagnosis to figure that out. I want you to know it today. Serving others creates the best environment for work, for love, for family that there is. And it's your only chance of leaving a legacy. So I want you to think about your leadership in these love word terms. If you loved the people you were leading right now, what would you know about them? How well would you know them? Would you know about their life experiences? Would you know about their families and their friends? Would you know exactly what their strengths are, what their values are, what they're hoping to achieve? And would you be part of the team that sets them up for personal success? Would you be thinking about ways to advance them, celebrate them, and thank them publicly for their work? And would you occasionally hug them in an HR-appropriate way? So I want you to reflect on these two thoughts, that if you were brave, how would you lead differently? And if you were serving others and loving those you lead, how would you lead differently? My final thought, I want to encourage you to deliver some kick-butt results, okay? I want you to be leaders that truly leave, leave a legacy. And to do that, we have to perform. I'll give you the word picture that I carry with me to help me remember to perform. One of the things you wouldn't know about me is my first major was music. <laughs> Didn't get very far with that, but I learned to accompany choirs as part of my studies of piano performance. And to this day, it really is part of who I am because I love traditional choir music. Here in Atlanta, there's a group called the Atlanta Master Chorale. It's led by a man named Eric Nelson. And Eric brings together every year a group of volunteer singers from the community, and he teaches them to sing remarkably difficult traditional choral music. He chooses nothing soft or easy for them. He meets with them eight times to prepare them for the final performance. The results he delivers are a thing of beauty. And I want you to take a look now at what volunteers can do with eight rehearsals. Thank you. 
He's a great leader, is he not? He's brave, he served his choir well, and the results he creates are a thing of great beauty. So it is with your leadership. You have the opportunity to serve the people so well that they create results of great beauty. I love to talk about this, and we're about out of time today, so I want to encourage you to talk back to me through social and digital media. I blog every week at Serving Performs, like the Twitter, Facebook thing, and I love to talk to young women like you. So let's keep this conversation going. In closing, I want to share with you one of my favorite stories. A couple of years ago, one of my mentors called me, and he woke me up kind of early. He likes to call at 7.30 in the morning. I'm not a morning person. He says, good morning, Cheryl. Have you considered your influence for today? And I said, well, no, Mac. I haven't even had a cup of coffee. But Mac continues, and he goes, Cheryl, I want you to think about this. Get out your calculator. Take the number of employees you serve. Time the number of days in the week. Time the number of hours that they work for you. I said, Mac, can I go get my coffee now? I'll, I'll be... I'll be right back. But the fact of the matter is, Mac is right, because if you serve five people in the year ahead, you have 10,000 hours of leadership with them. That's a lot of influence. And if you serve 50 people this year as a leader in the year ahead, you have 100,000 hours to influence them. And of course, if you have 500 people looking to you for leadership, you have over a million hours with them. Every one of us who serves in any capacity has an exponential opportunity to dare to serve, and I hope you'll be one of those. Thank you. The eye of the dark.